that in order for this to be the best year of your life, this must be the best year of your life spiritually. Uh, it, it, this is why Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else is going to be added to you. You want your health to get better? Let your spiritual life get better, and your health will get better. You want your money to get better this year? Let your spiritual life get better. L learn how to manage your money God's way, and your money will get better. I'm telling you, everything hinges on your spiritual life. And so in order for this to be the best year of your life, it must be the best year of your life spiritually. But listen, that won't happen by accident. You have to decide to make this year all that it could be. Now, Today's message is kind of standalone. It's not officially part of that series, but you can think of it as like a bonus message because if this year is going to be the best year of your life spiritually, you need to know, and here's my message title, you need to know how to strengthen your spirit. You need to know how to strengthen your spirit. So take notes today. I probably won't do as much yelling and screaming and shouting as I have been <laughs> the last couple of weeks, Jade, but I might, you know, you never know. All right, we're going to the book of Galatians. We're going to the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. We're, listen, we're uh, looking at the message Bible, the message paraphrase of the Bible. And it says this, my counsel is this, live freely, animated, and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with a free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are antithetical so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. And he asks this question at the end. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit? We want to show you how to be led by the Spirit today. Father, help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's during the 2020 quarantine. Uh, Elena and I were looking for something to keep us from losing our minds. Uh, and so a bunch of people got into a bunch of different things. I, like on social media, I found out that people got into baking bread while we was in isolation. I was like, no, that's, that sounds like work. <laughs> I'm on break. <laughs> and so Elena and I, we got into watching Marvel movies in 2020. We watched the entire MCU in timeline order, not by release date, timeline order. Uh, and so now we're Marvel people. We're all into it. We've seen every movie. We've seen every Disney Plus show. We've seen every breakdown on YouTube, new rock stars and screen crush, all of it. We watch them all. And listen, y'all know I'm a nerd, but y'all will be surprised. It's not me. It's Elena. She'd be like, well, what about new rock stars? I'd be like, yeah, you're a nerd now. You're a nerd. You're a comic book nerd. There was this series on Disney Plus a couple years ago called Moon Knight. Moon Knight was great. It's about a superhero, uh, superhero anti-hero type of thing. But this guy, he has multiple, uh, multiple personalities. Uh, and it reminded me of a movie uh, called Split uh, by uh, a director named M. Night Shyamalan uh, that was released in 2016. And it starred uh, a man by the name of James McAvoy. And he portrays this man, his name is Kevin Crumb, who suffers from dissociative identity disorder, what we used to call multiple personality disorder. And it's, it is, he, in the movie, Kevin has like 23 different personalities in one body. And it, in the movie Split, this is, it's portrayed in a very imaginative way, but the fact of the matter is DID, dissociative identity disorder, is a very real thing, and it's characterized by having at least two distinct personalities in one body. And there's an, other things that is characterized by memory loss and forgetfulness, anxiety, self-harm. But the thing that caught my attention is this, that each 
of the different personalities has different physical and physiological characteristics. For example, one personality requires glasses because their vision is impaired. The other personality in the same body needs no corrective lenses. One personality has high blood pressure. The other personality in the same blood, in the same body rather, has perfectly normal blood pressure levels. In other words, this is a mental condition that has physical expressions. And while none of us in here has 23 distinct personalities living inside of us like he did in the movie, although some of y'all might have. The truth is, all of us, all of us, look at your neighbor and say, yep, you too. All of us have at least two. There is a fleshly side and a spiritual side. There is what, 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 what I've heard called the humanly and the heavenly. And just like dissociative identity disorder, each of our sides has a unique physical expression. Oh, you don't believe me. All right, somebody lift your hands in here like you're in worship. Come on, come on, somebody lift your hands. Yes, yes, yes. Tell the Lord thank you. Come on, lift your hands and worship him. Yes, yeah. All right, now keep those hands up. Keep those hands up. That same hand, let somebody cut you off in traffic. And holy hand becomes unholy finger. Same, same body. Same person. Two different expressions. This is why Paul says this in Romans chapter 7, verse 18 in King James. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. At first he says in me, as if to say there's nothing good in me at all, but then he clarifies. He says in me, wait a minute, not me, my flesh. Because he understood that I have this flesh, I do. But once I give my life to Christ and my, my flesh is no longer the totality of my identity, when I gave my life to Christ, the Spirit took residence in my heart and I prayed to, Lord, to the Lord and they laid hands on me and I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And now I have the Spirit of God in my life, but I still got this flesh in me. All right, let me take this a step further. Y'all know I have a degree in chemistry from the Xavier University scientist at heart. When you sleep, about 90 minutes into your sleep cycle, you enter something called rapid eye movement, the REM cycle of sleep. And during REM sleep, your mind is very active and your dreams are really intense. And so while you're dreaming, your body releases a chemical that immobilizes you. It does this because your dreams can be so vivid while you're in REM sleep that your body might begin to act out the dream. And, there's, and, and you can actually hurt yourself. People who sleepwalk, that hormone that's supposed to immobilize their body, for whatever reason, their mind doesn't produce it the way it's supposed to. So they're supposed to not be able to move. You've experienced, some of you have experienced this sleep paralysis where you're like awake but you can't move. You ever had that before? There's a hormone that's in your body that your body is trying to stop you from acting out your dreams. Now, your body does this as a protection mechanism because you can hurt yourself because you be really, you're really asleep. But if you act it out, you could hurt yourself. But think about it. I want you to think about this. Your body releases a chemical that stops you from acting out your dreams. This is not a medication you take. This is how your body was designed. Let me say it this way then. Your body is designed to stop you from living out your dreams. This is not only concerning the dreams you have while you're asleep. Some of us got some big dreams and some big goals and some big visions. And listen, your flesh is literally designed to stop you from living them out. All right, let me take this a step further. I'm building to something, I promise. Let me take this a step further. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 17, the first part in the NIV says that every good 
and perfect gift comes from above. That includes your dreams, your visions, your passion, your goals. Everything that's good about you came from God. Hold that while we look at Romans chapter 7, verse 21, because he says, Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. In other words, watch this. When I want to do the good thing that God has called me to do, there's always something right there telling me I can't or I shouldn't or I won't. Now, if every time I want to do good, something is right there telling me to do the opposite, where did that thing come from? See, we read that scripture in Romans, when I want to do good, evil is right there present with me. We read that scripture like there's some external force that's stopping us from doing good. But, but I want you to think about this. If I smell something bad at home, and then I smell it in the car, and then I smell it while I'm driving to work, and then I smell it at work, guess what? It's... The bad thing that I'm smelling not coming from something around me, it must be coming from something. Huh. If every single time I want to do good, evil is right there with me, where's the evil? This has absolutely nothing to do with the devil or an enemy or a hater or a lack of re resources. Listen, I looked all throughout scripture. I didn't see one thing that let me know that the devil was omnipresent. Guess what? I couldn't find anywhere that let me know that the devil has the ability to be everywhere at the same time. So if I, every time I go to do good, there's something there to stop me, I can't be talking about the devil. Because the devil can't be everywhere at the same time. There are only two people that are with you all the time. God and you. And it can't be God because why would God stop you from doing the thing that God called you to do? Can I tell you something? Write this down. Take a picture. We've spent too much time casting the devil out of situations he was never in. We've spent so much energy worrying about haters when our names was never in their mouths. The truth of the matter is, I didn't need to cast the devil out. I needed to get me out of the way. And when you think about it, that's more concerning because if it's just about the devil, we can take care of the devil. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and I, we have authority over all the power of the enemy so that nothing can hurt us. Jesus gave us the victory over the devil. We have the power to overcome him with the name and the blood of Jesus. He's already a defeated foe. He's already under our feet. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's easy. And if it was just about haters, it's so easy to take care of haters. When I figured out, oh, thank you, Jesus, the life-changing ministry of the block button, oh, my level of freedom went to another level. You can block them on Facebook. You can block them on Instagram. You can block them on Twitter. You, X, you can block them from texting you. You can block them from calling you. Listen, you never have to interact with people who don't like you if you don't want to. The real challenge is, how do I block me from me? Now let me say this, because some of us take it too far. This is not to say that there is not an enemy that attempts to stop us from doing what the Lord told us to do. This is not to say that there are people who want to see you fail. I mean, there are. That's the reality of life. But this is to say this, that the first and greatest threat to your destiny is not some external force. It is your own flesh. And this is challenging because the devil is sneaky, but he didn't make you, so he doesn't know you. And your haters don't like you, probably because they don't know you either. 
but your flesh, your flesh knows exactly what to tell you to get you to stop. And remember what I just said about dreaming. Your body paralyzes you while you're dreaming. But not because your body hates you. Your body thinks it's protecting you. So, so the excuses that your flesh comes up with are at the very least reasonable. And so you say, you know what, I think I'm going to start working out. And immediately flesh goes, nope, knees, can't do it, can't do it, nope, mm-mm, mm-mm. And listen, you got knee problems. This is a valid excuse. And so you go, okay, well, I'll just, no, don't even worry about it. But listen, you can go to the gym and do other stuff, can't you? Bad knee don't mean you can't get some chest work and some arm work in, right? But the flesh says, oh, no, you don't even. It's safer to do nothing. Your flesh doesn't hate you. Your flesh hates change. And so you end up doing nothing because your flesh, not the devil, your flesh has convinced you that trying is more dangerous than changing. So then, Tori, if I can testify, when the diabetes kicks in, Tori, now I'm binding the devil. Saying, devil, I don't receive diabetes. The devil didn't give me diabetes. The devil wasn't drinking six Cokes a day. I was. Because I had a desire, my spirit had a desire for me to be healthier, but my flesh had a stronger desire. For Cokes, and Dr. Peppers, and Big Macs, and French fries, sweet and sour sauce. So, oh. <laughs> and because at the time, Curtis, my spirit was not strong enough to overcome my flesh, my flesh won, developed diabetes, and now I'm binding the devil. And the devil's like, I had nothing to do with that. That was you. How many situations have we gotten ourselves in? <laughs> Y'all all right? Y'all know I love you, right? How many situations have we gotten ourselves in? And now we bind in the devil. When it wasn't the devil, it was your flesh. And the problem wasn't that you're bad or you're evil. The problem wasn't just, it was that your spirit wasn't strong enough to overcome your flesh. So the question becomes, how do I strengthen my spirit? I want to give you four ways today. Listen, there are a multitude of ways to strengthen your spirit. I'll just give you four today. These are the four that the Lord gave me uh, to give to you today. These are four that you can start today. All right? You're going to get these four. Y'all going to parades today? <laughs> yep. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, I'm going to hurry up. All right. Number one, write these down. Take a picture. If you got your fill-in blanks, this is the first blank. You got to consume the word. Notice, I didn't say read it. You should read it. But you need to consume it. It needs to become a part of you. In Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus was led away by the Spirit to be tempted. I'm going to preach on that. that. That's a whole sermon by itself. The Spirit led Jesus away to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit did. The Spirit of God said, hey, I need you to go get tempted. <laughs> All right, never mind. Let me go off that. All right. Spirit of God leads Jesus to the desert, to the wilderness to be tempted. And when you look at verse 2, it says that Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible says that Jesus was hungry. Anybody in here ever been hungry? No, I mean like hungry, hungry. I mean, ha! I mean, donate blood to get a cookie hungry. Okay, y'all, never mind, never mind. <laughs> I mean, mayonnaise sandwich hungry. Two pieces of bread and some mayonnaise on it. I mean, buying menu, do, uh, dollar item menus with the spare change in your cup holder hungry, like I need something. 
Now, when you were that hungry, how long had it been since you've eaten? I mean a few hours probably. It hadn't been. Jesus hadn't eaten in a month and a half. He's past hungry. He's hungry. He's probably getting hangry too. Some of y'all haven't eaten since this morning and it's rough when I say good morning. Good morning. Whoa, you need somebody feed this person immediately. He wants food. The Bible says in verse 3 of Matthew 4 that the tempter says, oh, well, since you're so hungry, we'll just turn these stones into bread. The enemy challenges him with what he wants. All right. It's only temptation because it's what you want. If you didn't want it, it wouldn't be tempting. It'd be like, no. But there's a part of you, that flesh, that goes, well, I mean, I mean, a piece of bread couldn't hurt, huh? Bible says that he gets challenged to prepare bread. But I can imagine that Jesus has a word inside of him, Psalm 23 and 5, where David said, he'll prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Jesus is probably saying to himself, yeah, I know I'm hungry, but if I just hold on, the fact that there's an enemy here means that God is about to prepare a table here too because he prepares tables in the presence of enemies. And so Jesus answers him in Matthew 4, 4. He says, but he, it, asks, it says, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Notice here that when Jesus answers the enemy, he quotes directly from the word. He does it, he does it in verse 4. It is written. He does it again in verse 7. Jesus said to him, again, it is written. He does it again in verse 10. Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written. And then what happens in verse 11? The devil leaves. Here's the lesson. Write this down. Take a picture. When I'm struggling between what I want to do and what I know to do, I need to have enough word in me to strengthen my spirit over the flesh. What I want to do is forget about my hopes and dreams because the attack I'm going through is too much. But what I know to do is Psalm 34 and 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. What I want to do is say, forget these bills. Y'all can have all of this. I'm going back to the streets. But what I know to do is Philippians 4, 19. And my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What I want to do is give up and throw in the towel, but what I know to do got to be Galatians 6, 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing because in the end, eventually after some time, we're going to reap as long as we don't faint. I need the word in me. When my flesh wants to give up, I need the word in me to bring my spirit back and say, no, no, flesh, settle down. I got this. Number one, say consume the word. Number two, giving you four ways to strengthen your spirit. Number two, meditation. Meditation. There is a word that occurs 74 times in Scripture almost exclusively in the book of Psalm, and that word is selah. It means to stop, to pause, be silent for a moment. Tom Watson, one of my favorite theologians, said this, the reason we come away so cold from reading the word is because we do not warm ourselves at the fires of meditation. The word is alive and full of wonderful and rich revelation. But when we don't allow our spirit the opportunity to synthesize all that information, we might just miss the revelation. This is why the psalmist said in Psalm 119.55, the message paraphrase, he says, I meditate on your name 
all night, God, I treasure your revelation. Listen, whenever my phone is getting ready to get updated, there's a certain requirement that must take place. Hey, y'all stop ignoring those updates. They're important. Stop it. But if I go to update my phone, Kurt, and either my phone is not charging or does not have enough charge, the update will fail. And this is important because my phone updates in order to get the most up-to-date information. But if it has not set in silence to be charged, it will not be allowed to update in the same way. When it's time for the Lord to download new and fresh updates and revelation into my spirit, if I have not sat in silence to Selah, I'll be ineligible for the fresh move of God. But when I Selah, write this down, meditation bridges the gap between hearing from God and speaking to him. Without meditation and without prayer, uh, uh, reading the word, prayer is just a one-way conversation. It's just me unloading on God. But when I sit in silence and when I consume the word, it is God's opportunity to speak back to me. Because look at me, prayer is a conversation. It's not just me talking to God. It's giving myself an opportunity to hear what God has to say back to me. All right, we got to go. Number three. deeper theological waters, but we are here now. Praying in the Spirit. What we used to call praying in the Holy Ghost. How does praying in the Holy Ghost strengthen my spirit? What I am talking about here is what we've called colloquially speaking in tongues, although this is different from tongues as we understand them. Jude chapter 1 verse 20 in the King James Version says, but you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. How? By praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost pray, builds up your faith, faith in two ways. First, it is your spirit communicating directly to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, the first part in the English Standard Version, he says, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Uh, so, sometimes I need to go directly to God. Uh, you, when you were in elementary school, you ever, like, got into a fight? I know you did, Jade, but anybody? No, I'm just playing. I'm just, mess, I'm just messing with you, Jade. I'm just messing with you. When you're in elementary school and you got an elementary school bully, you got to handle him on your own. But if you're in elementary school and you got a high school bully, you need somebody bigger than you to come and fight on your behalf. Praying in the Holy Ghost, when your spirit prays directly to God, it's like saying, I got an enemy that's bigger than I can fight on my own. I need some reinforcements. But the other thing that he does that, that, is, that is important that praying in the Holy Spirit does is that praying in the Holy Spirit bypasses the flesh. So the full part of 1 Corinthians 14, too, the full verse says, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. And then it says, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. Listen, no one understands the one who's speaking in a tongue, not even the one who's speaking in the tongue. It says when you pray in the Holy Spirit, no one understands you, not even you. So if your spirit is, for example, saying, Praying. If you were to say, for example, in your, in your understanding, I need a new car, immediately your flesh will begin to say, you know you can't afford a new car, you know you don't have the credit score for it, you know you can't do this, you know you can't do that, not because it's bad, because it's trying to protect you. But when you pray in the Holy Spirit, your flesh does not even have an opportunity to combat what you're praying because your flesh don't know what you're praying. You don't even get an opportunity to negate what you're praying from your spirit because when you're praying out your spirit, your flesh is going, I don't even know what you're saying. I, they did a study about people praying in the spirit and, and, and speaking in tongues. The language center of your brain does not light up when you pray in the Holy Spirit. 
Because this is not about a natural language. This is beyond your flesh. And sometimes you got to pray beyond yourself. Watch this. Because you don't know what's coming. But your spirit does. Your spirit does. Your spirit knows what you need before you need it. And when you pray in the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you're building up your faith. It strengthens your spirit. And number four, I'm done, y'all. Four ways to strengthen your spirit. Consume the word. Meditate. Pray in the spirit. And number four, got to join a church. Got to join a church. Now, strengthening, I mean, joining a church strengthens your spirit in two ways. First, it's the place where we can come and learn more about God and who he is and his plan for our lives. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. But it says three verses before that in verse 14, how can they hear without a preacher? The church strengthens our spirit because it's the place where we hear the word of God through the preaching and teaching as directed by the Holy Spirit. But understand this. The act of walking into a church building does not in and of itself strengthen your spirit. It's not the church building that strengthens the spirit. It's the church community. It's being surrounded by people who are trying to win their own internal battles just like you are. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 12 that we are mutually encouraged by one another's faith. You encourage my faith and I encourage your faith. Paul said that when we get together, I'm not just coming to encourage you. I need you to encourage me too. And when you encourage me, I'll encourage her and she'll encourage him. And by the time we leave this place... Our spirits will be on fire together. That's the first way joining a church strengthens your spirit. But listen, remember I told you, there is an internal battle going on in every single one of you right now. Battle between your flesh and your spirit. The battle between what you know to do and what you want to do. And listen to me, listen to me. Inevitably, it's going to happen. Some point, your spirit's going to lose that battle. At some point, you're going to give in to the flesh. You are. It's okay. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You're trying to be better. You're trying to do better. But you're going to cuss when they get on your nerves. You're going to fail that bet. Y'all laughed a little too hard over here. I'm just playing. There's going to come a point in time when you're wrestling and wrestling, and you're going to be feeding your spirit. You're going to be praying in the Holy Spirit and meditating and consuming the Word, but you're going to mess up. You know why? Because the Bible says we all mess up. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory, all of us. So this is how church strengthens your spirit. Because the church is the place that when we fall, we're supposed to be able to come and get restored. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 in the New Living Translation says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Be careful not to fall into the same temptation. He says this, let's, let's share one another's burdens. And in this way, by sharing one another's burdens, that's how we fulfill the law of Christ. The church is supposed to be the place where we can come and go and say, I'm struggling in this area and I need some help. And it's not, hear me, it's not the church's job to judge this person and send them to hell. The Bible says that it's our responsibility to restore that person. 
The challenge is that person came in and said, I have a struggle in this area. And we said, whoa, you going to hell. And when they stopped coming to church, then we sent them to hell for not coming to church. No. This church, I can't talk about every church. This church will be a church of restoration. This is going to be a church that's free of judgment. The only thing I want people to feel is the love of God when they come in. And guess what? As they come in, their spirit is going to get built up more and more and more. And eventually, some of the fights that they were losing, their spirit is going to start winning. And they're going to become more and more and more like Jesus. And the atmosphere is going to change them. And they're going to keep coming and getting more and more. And eventually, we'll build them up and restore them so that the next time somebody's going through, that person can say, oh, no, I've been there. I've been there. And let me tell you, not what I read, but what I know, that God can still use you even though you messed up the way you did. This is why John the Revelator said in Revelation 12, verse 11, that they overcame by the blood, they overcame the enemy by what Jesus did on the cross, the blood of the Lamb. And because we talked about what we had been through. The words of our testimony. The blood gave us salvation, but to overcome this internal struggle, I need your testimony. I need to know that I'm not the only person to have dealt with this. And that if God can bring you out, he'll bring me out too. And little by little, our spirit gets a little stronger and gets a little stronger. And we start to win some of the battles that we used to lose. And somebody says or does something to us that would have sent us over the edge just a few months ago. But now it just rolls off our back. My flesh has not gone anywhere. My spirit has just gotten stronger hey I gotta go you're not losing the battles you're losing because you're bad your flesh is just too in control that's all and listen you're not praying for the Lord to put your flesh down you need your flesh hey you need your flesh all right, we got children in here. Uh, Elena and I didn't create our kids in the spirit. Are y'all? You need your flesh for some things. When you're hungry, you need your flesh. You need to eat. The challenge is not that you have flesh. The challenge is the flesh is in too much control. What we need to do is to learn how to bring our flesh under the subjection of the spirit. That means the spirit is calling the shots. The spirit tells the flesh when it's time for the flesh to flesh. Instead of the flesh telling the spirit when the flesh is going to flesh. Does that make sense? You're not bad. You just need to strengthen your spirit. So that when the flesh says, I want to do this, the spirit can go, <laughs> no. But right now, you don't have enough spiritual strength to fight, your, to fight your flesh. But it starts. It starts with a relationship with Jesus. Listen, if you could have handled your flesh on your own, you would have done it already. If you could stop smoking cigarettes on your own, you would have done it already. You need to strengthen your spirit. And as you strengthen the spirit, your flesh will go, I want to call him. And your spirit will say, no. Your flesh will say, I want to eat this. And your spirit will say, no. Listen, the spirit, your spirit's been saying no. It just wasn't strong enough. So it was saying, no. And your flesh is like, I want this. And your spirit is like, no. The more you strengthen spirit, the flesh will start going, I want this. And your spirit will be able to say, no. But it starts 
with the relationship with Jesus. That's where it starts. As a matter of fact, every head bowed, every eye closed. This is important. You need, you need help. You want to strengthen your spirit? You need some help. You need to get more word in you. You need to, to rest and be refreshed. You need to be filled with the spirit of God. You need to get around some people who are trying to win their own internal battles too. It starts with the relationship with Jesus. For those of you who are here who, who are saying, what, you know what, Pastor T? I didn't even realize. I didn't even realize. That's why I was losing some of the battles I was losing. I did not realize that my flesh was as in control as it is. I need a relationship with this Jesus. If that's you, with every head bowed, every eyes closed, nobody's looking around. We're not trying to put you on the spot. We're not trying to embarrass you. All I need you to do is just slip up your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor T. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Yeah, I see you. I, I need to strengthen my spirit. I need to I need to start winning some of these spirits. I'm tired of losing. I need to win some of these spiritual battles. Here's what I want you to do. As a matter of fact, everybody do this. Let's repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead with all power and with all victory. I claim that power and that victory and welcome Jesus into my life. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and choose to live a life modeled by him. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, guess what? If you prayed that prayer in faith for the first time, you're part of the family of God. You're saved. Come on, somebody say, welcome to the family. Here's what I want you to do. If you made a decision to receive Christ or if you want to join this church, if you're like, man, you know what? This is the church where I want to learn how to strengthen my spirit. We need you to do three things. First, you need to let us know. There's going to be a QR code behind me in just one moment. You can scan that QR code and fill it out. Or if you'd like to lift, uh, lift your hands, we'll serve you with a physical, what's called connect card. This is the way that we know what decision you've made and we'll connect with you this week and just rejoice and pray with you. Amen. The second thing you need to do is take the growth track. The growth track is our new me new members process. Although here at Empowerment, we don't have members. We have partners. Members have privileges. Partners have responsibilities. And we see the work of ministry as something that we are all equally responsible for. Four, uh, to build the things of God. And the next thing you got to do, if you made a decision, you got to get baptized. Just last Sunday, we had the opportunity to baptize six souls into the kingdom of God. The next one will be in April, on April the 7th. And so you have plenty of time if you want to take part in baptism. Were you blessed in this place today? Look at somebody and tell them, you're going to strengthen your spirit this week. Tell them, you're going to strengthen your spirit. So let's get ready to sow and to give as the Lord has blessed us. Uh, as you're getting ready to give, I want to tell you a story from the Bible real quick. It's from Genesis 12. It's from a guy named Abraham. Abraham's 75 years old. He's lived in one town for all 75 years of his life. He's got a nice life. He's got a nice family. He knows everyone in town. He's very comfortable. God comes to him and says, Abraham, I want you to leave. I want you to leave your hometown. I want you to travel to this land. I'm going to show you. God didn't even reveal the destination to him. He was just like, get, start moving. Get going. Here's the part I want you to see. The next day, the Bible says that Abraham loaded up and moved. And here's the principle that I want you to see. And it, we see it in this story, but it's all throughout scripture. And that's this, that the blessings of God always follow obedience. The blessings of God always follows obedience. So it's, it's offering time. And somebody in here is saying, oh, if God will give me a raise, well, then I'll be generous. But I got to tell you, it doesn't work like that. We obey God. Even when it's tough, even when it's hard, even when it makes us uncomfortable, because that's how faith works. We obey God, and then God blesses us. Abraham went on to become the father of many nations. He was famous. He was blessed. He was important. God blessed him with a family. In fact, the Bible says that all people on earth are blessed through Abraham, but none of that happened until after Abraham obeyed. And one of the big reasons we give every Sunday is because we have decided to obey 
God. We give generously because that's what the Bible teaches us. Even if it makes us uncomfortable, we want to be obedient to God because the blessings of God will follow our obedience to him. And so before we give, let us pray because I want our obedience as a church family and church community to go to the next level. As a matter of fact, every head bowed, every eye closed. Spirit of the living God, thank you that we are a church of obedience. God, that whatever you say, our answer is yes. And so if it's about our generosity, yes. If it's about our time, yes. If it's about our resources and our energy, yes. Our answer is yes to you. And so, Father, whatever you choose to do with what we give, we say that's not our concern. Our concern is our obedience. And so let us teach us obedience in the name of Jesus. We pray amen and thank God. Hey, listen, there's three ways you can give. You can give on an offering envelope for those of you who are in the building. If you'd like to give on an offering envelope, just lift your hands. Our team will be by to serve you in just one moment. You can also give digitally. All of the digital ways to give are behind me. You can give on Cash App, Dollar Sign, Empowerment NOLA, uh, on the website, empowermentnola.com slash giving. If you're watching online, all of the ways to give are there in the description box. If you're giving in the app, uh, you can also rather give in the app. You can use Apple Pay and Google Pay in the app if you'd like to do that. If you're watching online, one of the ways you can also give is through PayPal. The link for that is in the description box. Hey, listen, we say this every week. If you are a first-time guest, if this is your first time here, if you're not yet connected to Empowerment Church, please feel no pressure to give at this time. Why? Because we give as a means to support the vision and mission of the house. If you are not yet connected to the mission and vision of this house, feel no pressure to give. However, if the Lord is leading you to give, all of the ways to give, uh, we have been explained to you already. Amen. And so we are just thankful for whatever the Lord places on your heart to do. We're grateful for you now. All right. Hey, listen, let's do our month in a minute. Let's look at what's going on this month for the month of February, and we'll be back to close out. Good morning, Empowerment Church. My name is Tara Cedar, and this is your month in a minute. Happy birthday to our February Amethyst. And I hope this month will bring you all the happiness and joy your heart and hand can hold. Happy Black History Month. This is the month where we celebrate all of the achievements and accomplishments African Americans have been contributing since the inception of this country. Congratulations to our new partners. You have completed the growth track and we are ready to serve alongside of you. Now, for those of you who would like to become partners of Empowerment Church, please participate Participate in the Grow Track immediately at the service. We hope to see you there. Welcome to our first time visitors. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, we have a gift for you. See a member of the E-Team at the welcome table. The best way to start your morning off is with a little bit of prayer. So please join us on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 a.m. with Pastor John and Lady Juanita for morning prayer. Details are in the Empowerment app. So have you heard that we are going to two services? Well, in case you haven't, we are going to two services very soon and we need your help. So if you're interested in possibly doing Month in a Minute and would like to participate in possibly some other ministries, please come and see us at the welcome table. Please sign up in under volunteer in the Empowerment app. We are ready to serve alongside of you as we continue to expand and grow. I'm Tara Cedar, and this has been Your Month in a Minute. Thank you, Terrell Cedar. We're going to two services on March the 17th, and we're excited about growth. Look at somebody saying, we're making room. We're making room. We're making room. If you get, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. We are making room for what's about to happen because we believe that something big is about to happen. All right? Um, let's lift your gifts. If you're offering envelope, your cell phone, whatever method you gave to give, you used to give, let's lift it and pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to sow good seed into good soil. Thank you for what we are able to give. We pray that you'll multiply the seed sown and give it back to us, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Just wave those gifts and say, there's more where that came from. Amen. Amen. Just pass those down to those inside aisles. Amen. We'll be about to collect them from you in just one moment. Hey, listen, there's a way, right? Break it down real quick, y'all. In the app on the home screen, uh, there's a button that says 
book coffee or coffee with the pastors. We want to, Pastor Lane and I, we want to have coffee with you. We want to sit. Sunday mornings is our time to preach. Saturday is our time to pastor. That's when we sit at the coffee table and see what God has put on the inside of you and how we can support the dreams and visions that God has given you. And finally, if you are in need of your contribution statements, amen, just send an email to admin at empowerment NOLA, amen, and we will get your contribution request to you for your tax purposes. Were you blessed in this place today? Do me a favor, stand to your feet all over the building. Give your neighbor a great big hug. I'm so happy to worship with you today. Break it down one, one time, y'all. Listen, our intercessors are moving into place at this time. Hey, if you, one of the values of our church is that prayer is our priority. And if you need someone to pray with you and for you on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you can come here to the altar and we'll be more than happy, amen, to pray with you and for you. Listen, the kids are here already. They're in the back. Uh, 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 along the, the, the uh, last section in here in the auditorium. Amen. So you don't have to go outside and get them. We brought your kids to you. Amen. And so uh, we are excited about all that God is doing. Spirit of the living God, thank you for what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard. Thank you for all you're speaking in us and to us. God, thank you for strengthening our spirit. God, we're going to start winning some of these battles. We love you and bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First time guests, go get your gift if you want to do the growth track. Meet us at this door here to my right, your left, and we'll see you next week.